All right, welcome back to the absurd machine. Um, I've kind of gone ahead and modeled out uh, the, the machine as you can see here as I rotate around um, here. Uh, again, I'm going to go ahead and go over how I, I completed some of these things. I kind of just kind of moved ahead, made a real cartoony one, made this thing. And again, even though this is not a modeling-centric um, uh, video series, I'm going to show you how I, I kind of tackled some of these uh, modeling functions and how I model these. Now, they're by no means going to take a, a, a someone that has no modeling experience or hasn't watched any other videos, um, or it might be harder to follow. So I do recommend that you um, follow the uh, introductory videos uh, playlist that I have listed below in the details of this of this series um, before actually doing this assignment. So. Um, a couple things that I left off. Um, we left off doing these hoses. We talked about beveling them. Um, I kind of made this little gauge thing here. That's going to be a little, you know, like gauge that can rotate back and forth. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly go over how I made these. Just more as this, you know, just you know, if you never tried this before, um, this was made with just a cylinder cut in half. So if you go to create polygon primitives, create a cylinder. You can look at the cylinder. And as long as it has an even line across there, you can cut the bottom half of the faces off. Again, don't forget that you can go into your inputs of the cylinder and change the number of subdivisions along the axis if you want to make this rounder. So, for example, if I did like 32, I can make this a little bit rounder across here. And then what you would do is you would cut either side of these faces off. This is kind of how I did this. So I came in here and selected these faces. Again, remember anything the marquee touches, when you drag and select, it will select. And always be sure that you rotate around, tumble in your camera to make sure that you don't, you know, don't have things you don't want to. As you can see, I, I have things I don't want. And, you know, Make sure what is correct is selected. So this is no big deal. All I have to do is hold down Control, which is deselect, and select the other way. And again, anything this touches, it will get rid of. Deselect in this case. So once you have half of this, just to hit the delete key or backspace on your keyboard, um, and you'll get rid of them. Now again, if you're, you don't remember how to get into this particular mode, there's a mistake there. If you don't remember how to get into this mode, this is subcomponent mode. Uh, we briefly talked about this in the last video, and of course it's covered in the other series. But you always right-click and hold on an object to get into a subcomponent mode, in this case, face. So again, like I said, I'll, I'll do my best to narrate all these things, but... Um, for the sake of time, we're kind of going a little bit faster on the modeling on modeling aspects of here. I'm just here to show you uh, tips and tricks, um, as if it were, of how I made these shapes. So we'll go ahead and delete those. Now I went to switch back to object mode. Now the thing when you delete something like this, you're going to leave a gap, and like I like to call it paper thin geometry has no thickness. So technically, there's nothing wrong with this, but um, we kind of need to fix this for what I'm doing um, here. So what I did, this is, can be solved really easily. We can put a cap on this by doing an operation called fill hole. That is found under uh, uh, mesh fill hole, and it should automatically work. Um, if you have any problems with stuff that you're doing with fill hole, for example, see mine worked right there, it sometimes helps to select the edges. Mine worked fine, but if you're having a problem, sometimes it does help to double click and select the edges before you do the fill hole operation but honestly I'm betting from you know, most most people that do this if they're not gonna have to do that so just again fill hole on the object should be fine then what I did is I adjusted the thickness the way I liked made it a little bit thinner and then I selected the outer faces and again you know just you know I used the scale tool to thin it which is the R key went back into face mode and I'm going to select these outer faces. And again, to select a face loop, you click on one. And then any, any tool, hold down shift and double click an adjacent face, and it will select a face loop or ring, depending on which way you, you click. Um, in this case, it's selected the whole face loop here. And that's all the way around. As long as there's um, quads, it will, it will go. And technically, this is an inside of poly, but since it was, it was the last one, it did it fine. So all the way around, and again, you can see me tumbling my camera to make sure everything's selected the way I want. Or, of course, you can manually click them one by one. But again, 
clicking on a face and then shift double clicking an adjacent face will select a face ring or loop. So what I did after this is I to get this kind of thickness here is I extruded this outward so I could get the outer thickness and then I extruded again to get this you know kind of coming out. So to walk you through that, control E for extrude. Control E for extrude. Computer is going a little slower here. Try this again. Let me make sure I'm due back just to be sure. Oh. Control E for extrude. There we go. And I'm going to grab the blue arrow. Remember, whenever you're doing extrude, most of the time the blue, you're going to want the blue arrow, which is local. Now, this is technically going to be wrong here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I said most of the time. And you can see it technically is working as pulling along the local, but it gets a little weird around areas where there's very sharp changes from local spaces here. It tries to average it out. And most of the time, especially if you're doing mechanical stuff, this is not what you want. So I'm just going to undo back. We still want the extrude, so I didn't undo back to where as I saw the extrude. We just don't want to do local Z transit. That's the blue arrow. We just want to increase the thickness, actually. So this is where more mechanical, where we want everything to be even. You can see I'm just clicking on that word and dragging left and right. And don't forget, our from our previous lectures, holding down control can let you tone this down so you don't it doesn't go so fast. Or if you want to, you can just type a number in here. But we want thickness in the secondary options here. So that's how I got this thickness around it. And then I did another extrude around this part. So again, click, hold down shift, double click, and then extrude it again. And this time, yes, we just want the blue arrow. And you can see that's how I made this shape. Now, I'm not practicing clean modeling habits for this video. So if you are a modeler, you know, you can, you know, there is definitely more you should be doing, like this is an inside of polygon and things like that. But again, we're just trying to get this going for the video. Now, feel free to come in here and tweak this after the fact and scale it, you know, if you want it more like this or, you know, however you want to do it. But this is what I did for this gauge readout thing here that is stuck on there. I just rotated this 90 degrees and made sure it was 90 or negative 90 degrees, depending on which way your model's facing. And I just threw that up there. Now the other shape here, this is just a, a prism um, under the, the, the primitives here, under create create uh, polygon primitives, it's just a prism right here. So if you just create a prism, you can um, just create a prism shape and then you can just scale and distort this however you want and stick it in there as well. So you can do that um, um, to, um, to get the kind of this kind of like gauge readout thing. Um, so that way, that way, um, that way, uh, you can uh, you can get that little gauge readout uh, going there. So uh, that's how we made this this shape right here. These shapes right here. Um, also, in addition, like this particular thing, uh, these are just cylinders, a little bit extruded. I'm not going to go through how to make them, but the one thing I do want to do um, talk about here. Is is if you do something like this where they're just kind of off-centered, I strongly recommend that you maintain or at least memorize that number um, right there. Rotate. I mean, again, um, because we're going to talk about things called freeze transformations uh, down the line here, which I'm going to show you on this one. But you don't generally want to freeze your rotate, and the reason why is it's okay for modeling; doesn't really matter as much. But for animation you need to be able to have that rotation. So if I was going to animate the scale, which, which is what I'm going to do on these, they can, they can be, because I'm going very cartoony, you can scale them up and down, up and down, up and down like this without um, having that problem of them being off, off rotation. So if you, do, if you freeze your rotation, then what happens is um, you're going to have a problem with the, the the, the 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 scale wanting to go up and down up and down instead of left and right. So be sure that you don't um, freeze the transformations on this. And again, uh, freezing transformations is an operation that you can do under modify. Uh, we haven't talked about this in great detail, but again, I'm going to talk about it here and just want you to call that out for for you. Um, so what that does is is for example, if we rotate this one, I'll do it on this one right here. 
th this, and, you know, technically this doesn't even need to be frozen, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. What frozen transformations does is it, it reduces these values to zeros and ones, back to how they were initially created, but it doesn't actually move it. Like we talked about in the last video, if we actually type these numbers and zero them out, it would go to the origin. So what we're doing instead is if we hit freeze transformations under modify, freeze transformations, it's going to zero out and one the scale, zero out the values and one the scale, but then it's actually going to move it. So now if I were to move this object and then hit zero, it's going to go back to wherever I froze it. This is useful for certain operations in animation. Um, like this one, has got, it might be, it technically could be useful for. Um, we, we probably don't need to freeze this one, but this would be a great example. Let's say you had something that's a little bit stranger, and let's say you had a value, I, I don't, but let's say you had a value on this that you want to get rid of and you want it to be at the quote unquote zero. This would be a case of when you would want to freeze this, you'd freeze the transformations, and then you could come back in here and just animate the rotation when you go to animate it. So again, this is you know not a perfect example, but that's examples of how you might use freeze transformations. We'll definitely talk about it um, in future lectures, but I want you to be sure that if you if you're aware of freeze transformations, because you, let's say you have modeling experience, be careful that you don't freeze something when you want it to be off kiltered like this. And again, because I'm going to scale this up and down when I go to animate it. What you can do if you need to freeze it is, and this is how I handle this situation, is I zero it out, make sure, because when you freeze stuff, it's generally better to have it orthogonally aligned, meaning straight with the grid, up or down, left, right, whatever. So this is straight up and down. Then you freeze it, freeze transformations, and then you you type in the, 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 the value. Like I said, I advise you to remember that value, that rotation, because we want, all the thing we care about is this rotation here in this particular case. So again, that we want to keep that. So there we go. And again, it's not essential for this, but you know, we want to do that. Okay. So uh, um, hopefully uh, you remember that those lessons, it, that one can take a little bit of, of getting used to, like firsthand experience where you need to actually um, do that. And that's why, again, I always recommend you make copies of things as you go because you never know when you might accidentally mess something up and you didn't intend to. And that's, that's one of these things. All right. So these objects here. I'm not going to recreate these, but I'll t walk talk you through it. All it was was a cube, selected one face, extruded in, you know, to get the this this thickness and then extruded again and pulled the face down. All this is is a cube that I grabbed the vertices and and, and scaled them a little bit and then I just hit bevel on the entire thing. Uh, these are actually the default set settings on the bevel. So, again, that was just a cube that was kind of this shape with just hitting control B on it and you kind of you can kind of see that it's that. So I, again, I didn't spend a lot of time on the modeling here. Uh, this is just a cylinder that is got a bevel on the top and the bottom faces are scaled scaled in a little bit. Uh, we did the tubes last le lecture. So if you if you if you missed that, please feel free to look at the first video in this playlist. Uh, this box because because I have this thing going into the quote unquote ceiling here. I built a little box around it. You don't have to technically do this for your exercises, um, but you know, I kind of wanted to contain it. You know, it's kind of a framing device in this particular case. And um, what I did here is it's just a cube, a polygon cube, big one, where we delete one face and we get something like this. Now, the thing about this is if you see solid black or really dark colors here, this is Maya's way of denoting that this is the inside of the object. It does matter for purposes of rendering. Um, so if you make yours paper thin, mine's not paper thin, um, you can reverse this by going to um, selecting the object and going mesh display, reverse, and it will do this. So you can see now it's the opposite. So if your object is paper thin, as this cube, because I deleted one face of it, that's, I like to call this paper thin, there's no thickness to this. It has an inside and outside. So again, anything that's solid black, like in this side, this side might have rendering issues. There's technically ways around it, but it could have rendering issues. This side is the fine side because I reversed it. Now, 
Another way you can get around this, if you don't want to deal with two sides, is you can just select the entire object and just hit in, in object mode and hit Control E for extrude and grab the blue arrow and drag one way or the other. It's probably going to be wrong, but that's okay. You can see if I drag, drag it like this, you can see it's solid black. This whole object technically is inside out. Um, if I went the other way, it would have been fine, but I just wanted to show you what it looked like if it was inside out. And again, if you have this problem, it's fixed the exact same way I just I, I mentioned before, which is mesh display reverse. So you turn the object back the right way. So this is the way Maya wants to render it. So that's how you that's why if it's solid black, you know it's trying to render the inside. Um, so that's how I made this little box and I you know some bevels on there and then you know called it a day. Okay. Um, so that's kind of, like I said, an overview of the remaining modeling I did. Um, again, this is not a lecture that's going to focus heavily on, you know, materials, but just to recap here real quick, I'll go ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and show, um, how to assign materials and how to quickly edit them, but I'm not going to go through every single property or setting, um, in there. Again, there's other videos in the link description below that do, will cover this in much more detail. So materials, um, for case if you've never watched a video on materials yet, they're just how an object um, reflects light, um, and they contain other things such as texture and color and things like that. Um, out of the box, Maya, is, as you can't tell already, it's putting this gray material called Lambert on everything, called Lambert 1. Now, when we get into the settings, there are places where you can mess with Lambert 1. Please don't mess with Lambert 1. Leave Lambert 1 alone. It likes to be left alone. It's just a good practice habit. In case you accidentally make something we weird, then when you create something new, it won't have that weird texture on it or material on it. So always leave Lambert 1 alone. That's my first rule that I would recommend that you follow. My second rule is... Um, you don't need to create a lot of materials for this. And again, because I'm recommending that you stick to cartoony things, I would honestly do just, just simple colors. If you have more experience and you know how to do UVs and textures and you want to do those things, I absolutely encourage it. But again, if you have no uh, uh, modeling or texturing experience, simple colors will work. And what you can do is we're just going to stick to the most simple colors that we possibly can. And that is, um, we're going to stick to Lambert's and Blend's um, for the most part. So Lambert, as I mentioned previously, is dull and chalky. Um, and again, you can kind of see this kind of gray here. This is a dull, chalky Lambert one. And I'll sign a Blend here as my first material to show you the difference as we go. So let's say I'm gonna, I want to edit this pipe here. I'm going to put a color on this. To add a color, there's a lot of different ways of doing this. But what I'm going to do is right-click on this particular object the same way we go into subcomponent mode, and I'm going to click and hold, right-click and hold, and I'm going to go down to assign. I'll just do favorite material, assign favorite material, blend. Now there's a lot of different shaders out there, especially depending on what settings you have, what you have loaded into Maya. But you should always have these default uh, materials. So blend, I'll sign here. And it'll automatically assign the blend. It should open up in what's called the attribute editor. And it kind of previews the material here. Blend, it's using the same gray. If I click off of this, you can see it is much more shiny. And as I rotate around, tumble the camera, you can see it has a specular highlight here um, for the uh, for this gray. Now you can go in and mess with the, the attribute colors a lot of different ways. Um, again, I'm going to kind of stick to like a more straightforward, simplistic way instead of getting into, in the, into the weeds on, on more, more detailed ones. But if you select any object that has a material on it, the attribute editor, which is on the right-hand side, it's not the channel box, but the attribute editor, the channel box is this one that you're used to so far in this lecture series. The attribute editor is this one I hear right here. This icon looks like slider uh, bars to me um, right there. And if you don't like icons, it has a correspondent, you know, word tab on the right-hand side. This is the attribute editor. It's very similar to the channel box. The difference is it has generally more information. It's just kind of, and sometimes it has, lots of times it has duplicate information. It's just, it's shown a little bit differently. But it also has tabs across the top of all the operations that make up that particular object. 
you'll generally have at least two that make up the default. If you, even if you did nothing to the thing, you're going to have at least two here. And then as you start doing certain operations like bends, extrudes, it'll add a tab for each one. This is called history. You can see this in the channel box as well. If I click on the channel box, um, if an object has history, it'll have a, have history. Um, looks like I might have deleted the history on this particular object, but if it does, it has a history. So I have a delete edge here, um, a blend, a blend of form, and you can see I'm clicking these little arrows here. And there's different tabs. Um, this brings us to um, a couple things here. I talked about history, and personally, this is a great opportunity to, to clean things up. Um, you can do this actually fairly quickly if you don't need to worry about any sort of bend deformers again um, or anything that, that kind of history. Um, we didn't do anything that you need to worry about yet so far. So you can easily just select everything in your scene. In fact, you don't even do that. You can go edit and go edit, delete by type, history. Or you can do all by type if you, if you don't have everything selected. Now, the only time you do not want to do this, because this is a great thing to have, is actually there's two reasons. Uh, is you don't you don't you, you're you're still messing with your inputs, i.e. you want to get back to your inputs because this will obliterate your inputs. And the second thing is you if you have like bin deformers or deformers, you would, like last video we used a deformer to, to mess with these. If you still think you might want to tweak those things, you don't delete your history. But if you are done, uh, you should go in and delete your history. And in fact, you will do this before you start animating. So at some point. I do recommend that you do this. If you're unsure, just save out your scene as something else, and then, then you know on the new scene, you know just you make a copy, then delete your history. I'm going to go ahead and delete my history and everything here. And what this has done is it's reduced the amount of tabs up here, so it's it's kind of frozen everything in place, kind of like kind of like a freeze transformation, but of other tr things it was keeping track of, other operations you've done. Um, so freeze transformations deals with the world where delete history deals with the operations you've done on it. So if you deleted the history on this, and you can see it should only have three tabs most of the time. I mean, there might be cases I can't think of one off the top of my head, but there might be cases where there might be more, but most of the time you're going to have three tabs. And you can see one of these is called blend one. This is your material. This is the material that's on here. Now, if you have a hard time finding this, that's fine. Even if you, let's say, you don't want to delete the history yet, there's another way of getting to that. Um, perhaps this one's even more simple. Um, I just rec I'm just a big proponent of um, of cleaning your history and keeping things clean, especially for animation, because you want to make sure that there's nothing that might be influencing your animation as you go. Um, but if you want to keep it around, that's fine. And you have a hard time. You can right-click on an object and go to Material Attributes, and it'll automatically will op go to that material on that object in this case. So. Um, with material attributes here, again, this is all the settings of an object. I'm not going to go through all of these, but just a real quick recap. If you click on the little color swatch here, um, you know, you can change the color of something. And again, I'm just messing with the hue here, the color here, and, and so on. And you can mess with the transparency if you want to make something see-through. You can make it see-through um, just by dragging the slider back and forth. Ambient color is how dark something is on the, sh or how dark or light something is on the shaded side. If you want to look more cartoony, um, you can increase the ambient. I recommend if you do this, you don't do it by much. Um, this one definitely would be better if we had a light in the scene, though, before we start messing with that. Incandescence, we'll just skip past that. Bump map will skip past. This is again, this is not a material video, so bump map's awesome, but we don't have. We're not going to talk about that. Fuse is. Um, how how dark or how sorry how much that color remains in in darkness so the a higher diffuse is going to hold onto its color longer. Um, technically, what people do is they actually darken the color if they're in a dark scene. But if you wanted to do it correctly, you'd pick the color as if it were in like a bright noon sun, and you would mess with the diffuse um, to actually make that metal be darker. That way, when you 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 actually light the scene. Um, it'll automatically take your lighting into consideration. Uh, translucence is your mimic candle wax. I honestly don't even like any of these. I don't, I don't even talk about these in detail. In my detailed video on materials, I recommend staying, you know, staying away from them unless you're doing a very specialized effect, which then you know you would watch a tutorial or do a tutorial just specifically for that. Maybe we'll have a candle wax tutorial at some point, but again, no point in doing those right now. 
uh, specular shading. Now when you see specular shading, now we're specifically talking about the highlight. As you might have noticed, the Lambert does not have a specular highlight. Blends do. Blends have a specular highlight. This may let you affect that highlight. You can mess with these settings, intensity, how big it is, raw, raw, almost like opacity. You can tweak the color however you want. Um, a quick tip here is if you want your object to look like plastic, leave the specular color alone, or at least go to like a, a monochromatic white, you know, or some value of monochromatic white or black. If you want it to look more like metal, um, I generally recommend you make it a brighter version, almost near white version of the color that the metal is. So in this case, if I want this to be more metallic, I can go really bright blue, really, 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 really light. I'm clicking on the swatch here. It's just taking forever to load. And I can go, come on, like really, really, really light blue. And, you know, it'll, it'll look a little more metallic. Reflectivity, if you're doing a render that has reflective color, uh, reflectivity, i.e. it can bounce light, it will make it more mirror-like. The higher this number is, the less mirror-like the lower it is. Um, you probably won't be using a renderer um, in this first exercise um, that has reflectivity, but if you are, then you can just turn this off if you want to, or you can leave it at 0.5. I find 0.5 is a weird default personally, but whatever. Um, but that's if you have, you know, if the renderer you're using, i.e. the camera, it's kind of, kind of how it takes a picture of it, supports reflectivity, that's how you would control that for per material. And the reflective color will tend to kind of, kind of tint the color based on whatever it's reflecting. So there we go. Here's my blue metal, and this is, this is good. You know, again, I don't want to get too carried away. I'm just going to call this blue metal. And I, how we're going to do that is just click up here and rename it. And again, you just click up there. Hi, you know, just left clicking and holding, and I just type in there. Um, you can your naming conventions can be whatever you wish. Um, I don't mind however you want to name them, but I do strongly recommend that you name them because a lot of times you will when you look at a material, it'll be in a list in, list format, which you're about to see here shortly, um, and you won't know what it is unless unless you know it by name. So if you have keep saving things as blend, 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 blend. You're not going to know what it is. Um, so I recommend that you name your materials that you decide to keep. If you're not sure if you want to keep them, then obviously don't, you know, you don't have to spend your time doing that. But anything that you want to keep, go ahead and cha uh, change the name of it. So there we go. So I, I have a blue metal. I mean, I went through that very, very fast. But um, again, we have a video for materials. Uh, again, link will be in the uh, below. It's in the, the Maya Basics. Um, in there, and you can watch a, a very detailed lecture on materials um, for that. The thing you need, you need to know is that you need to block in a material, and once you've blocked it in, you don't need to do it again. This is a common mistake. What students will do is they'll come in here and I, I'm going to make a blue for this. You don't have to keep making them. You, once you've made it once, you have it. And that's why I said I advise you name them. So what I can do is I can say, maybe I want this to be blue. I can right click and hold on this. And I can go down to assign existing materials because it already exists. And there it is. You see it's in a list format. And it says blue metal material. There we go. And you can see I've added to there. Now if I ever make a change to this material, it will update to both of them. Let's say I make it a little bit darker. Either one. doesn't matter which one I select. But let's say I make them darker. They will all get darker. This is good and bad. It means, you know, I don't have to go through there and manip manipulate them all. Um, so it's up to you. And if you ever want to switch them, or let's say you don't want this to be the dark blue anymore, you can just right click and assign a new material on it. Or if you already have another material, you can assign that material to it. So that's how you break the material from it. So if you want it to be somewhere di something different, you can do that. Or if, you know, like I said, don't mess with Lambert 1, that you always have Lambert 1 to fall back to. I can right click, hold, assign existing material, Lambert 1. You can see I can get back to that. All right, so you can always sign it. I'm going to undo. I'm going to keep the blue. All right, I'm going to come in here and, and assign some, some of this material. And you can actually do this at multiples. So I'm going to go ahead and I, I'm going to go ahead and grab all these materials, right click and hold, assign this material, blue metal. So I just selected multiple objects. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I guess I'll put on these little knob things too. Sign this material, blue metal. There you go. So I'll do that. Uh, do I want the gears to be? No, nah, I don't think I want the gears to be blue. Um, all right. Uh, let's go ahead and make this thing. No, I don't want to do that. 
Okay, um, so let's see. Um, let's go ahead and make another material for this. I'm going to right click and sign a new material because I, I, I favorite material. I'll go ahead and do another blend. And I'm just going to go ahead and make this. I'm going to make this, like I said, I like to call this sometimes clowning it up because I tend to make it some random color that I kind of dial it in later. I'm going to make this like an orangey color kind of color. So I'm clowning my up uh, my my uh, my uh, my machine here. Just picking some random colors. I'm not going to even really play with it much more than that. Maybe I'll make this make the specular color a different color. But really, since it has such a huge flat surface, you're barely going to see the specular color. But I do want it to be specular. All right. Um, let me think here. Uh, this of course needs to be red. I'm just going to make this sign, sign this now because it's easy. Oh, I forgot to go and rename my other thing. So let me go back. Bad structure. Let me change this to orange metal. And I like to do under, underscore MAT for material myself. But again, um, let's, let's add this here. I'm just going to sign in material. I'm going to do Lambert. Lamberts are, again, they have no specular highlight. They're sim even simpler. I'm just going to call this red underscore matte. I'm just going to make this red. I'll make this bright red. I missed. So there we go. Very bright red. And again, I might change the colors as I go. All right. Now we have some issues here. Like I can come in here, and let's say I do. Let's say I want to make this uh, sign existing material, blue material. And, that, you know, I don't mind that, but I don't want the interior of this to be um, blue. I want it to be something different. Now, this is not not the best way of doing this, um, and, and I say that coming from more of a, um, from like a video game industry experience here, um, but we, you don't generally want, to, you want to try to minimize the amount of materials you're using, but again, this doesn't matter for this one too much, um, because again, we're just making, we're practicing animation, uh, it could be for film, and as long as it works and renders, it's fine for what we're doing. But I, I am going to show you the easy way of doing this. But just to kind of clarify how we would normally do this is we try to generally try to make this, like maybe use a UV to get this and make it one material to get this thing. Um, but anyway, we don't, we don't need, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do instead is we're going to just going to go ahead and sign a second material on this. And we're going to sign it directly to these faces. And you can actually select faces and assign straight materials to them. So I'm just I'm holding down one to face mode. I'm grabbing these materials here. And I'm gonna go ahead and right click, sign favorite material, Lambert, and I'm just gonna make call this white underscore mat for myself. And I'll go ahead and make this just white. Now again, if you know stuff like with like you know um, um, how to do textures and UVs, like we could put like little lines and stuff in here with using textures, but Again, that's beyond the scope of this current lecture. So I'm just going to go ahead and put two materials in this one and call it a day. All right. All right, moving on. Um, I'm going to go ahead and actually, you know what? I think I'm going to change these knobs. You can make changes. I'm going to make these red so they stand out a little bit more. So I'll assign existing material red. I'm going to select these. Assign existing material blue. And the exact same thing. I'm going to select these faces. Um, you can select these multiple times. You know what? You can just make this easy, and to, and to show you guys, well, yeah, you can see you can see that you can do these all at once or one at a time. And all I'm doing is I'm selecting them, right clicking, and holding, going to face mode, and so on. But as I said, we could you could also just do one and then just duplicate it. But I was already there, so I was like, eh, okay, I'll do that. All right. So you can see. And don't forget F8 is the quick key to switch back to option mode. And it looks like I accidentally somehow had a face over here selected, so let's fix that. Again, always rotate around, looking at your, your thing. So re fix that one. There we go. So you can see, got that going. All right. Um, right. I'm trying to decide if I want these gears to be a different color. Um, let me go ahead and see what they look like blue. Let's go ahead and, that's the great thing, so we can kind of see eh, it's okay it's okay 
I would probably go a different color, but you know, just to keep this simplistic for now, I'm going to go ahead and leave those alone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, make these tubes a different color, and I think I'll make these smokestacks. Well, you know what? I'll make these smokestacks. Try making these these smokestacks orange and see what we get. And I don't know if I care for that. Let's go ahead and do the smokestacks or these tubes first. So I'm going to sign a new material. I definitely want to make these Lamberts, I think, for myself. And I think, again, this might look hideous, but I think I'm going to go like a really limey green here. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's, that's absolutely hideous. I love it. There we go. And of course, make be sure you name your um, your materials. Light green underscore matte. There we go. Uh, this probably won't work, but let's try it anyway. Light green. Yeah, sure. Get a little more green. Doesn't make sense, but for the sake of the variety, I, I like it a little bit better. Okay, so I got these these Lamberts in there with these light greens. Uh, the, you know the these other things, and I think I'm just going to leave this box as our Lambert. So I think this is pretty good. I mean, again, it's not the prettiest thing, but it's it's obviously easy to see what's going on here um, and the materials um, to go for here. Um, the last thing I would do before you really start animating, it's not vital to get it finalized, but I do recommend that you do it as you explore your lights. Um, and again, this falls under the same uh, unfortunate uh, condition as I mentioned with the materials. I'm not going to go into details with lights. Again, this is covered in some of those other play playlists list below. But what I recommend you do is you create some lights. Now, um, if you have a top like mine, this might be not work too well, but the most common light that you will use is a create light directional light. Now, what a directional light will do is it, it, it imitates a distant but powerful light source such as the sun that casts lights in a parallel um, parallel rays. Um, so if I click on this and, and do this, it's going to create the object, and you're like, where did it go? It's always at the origin. Remember from when we talked about last time, my sometimes likes to do things and puts them at the origin. Um, so this is at the origin, and again, I just hit the four key wireframe to see this. Now I can select the light, or I can do it in the outliner. Grab it, move it out of the way. Five key, back to materials once I have it. And again, this is just a little bit of arrows, so in a, it doesn't rep, doesn't matter where it's positioned in the world since it's such a powerful light source. All that matters is where it's rotated. And if I rotate this, it will manipulate the light. So if I hit the E key, I'm rotating it, but you'll see nothing happen. You're like, where? What's going on? So you kind of kind of kind of stepped through these two already. Four key is wireframe. Five is shaded. Six is with textures. We don't have any textures in this scene, but six is with textures. And seven is to preview with lights. So if I preview with lights on by hitting the seven key, now as I start rotating this, you will see the lights affect the scene. So if you want to have lights, you can see the light affect it. Now I'm not going to um, go into all the, the details. Again, there's lots of other lights. Um, uh, maybe I'll do one other one just to kind of show it, but you know, um, this is the light I'm going to go into um, mainly. And again, you can mess with the color here and the intensity. Color is the color of the light. Intensity is how bright it is. If you're doing um, what's called uh, non-decay lights, which uh, directional light usually is, I recommend that you try to keep your intensity around one for all your lights in your scene. Of course, you can go above that, you know, but if people start ramming, you know, turning this way up and it kind of gets blown out. I don't recommend doing that. Now, there was a keyword that I used there. I'm going to back up and talk about it again. Non-decay lights. And in more advanced lighting lectures, we'll talk about that. Um, so again, for right now, you're most likely going to stick to one because we're not, we're not going to be talking about those lighting things here. All right. The other thing you might want to consider doing is um, turn on shadows. And that, there's a little drop box right here for shadows. Shadows by default are off. Um, 
in Maya. At least it used to be. Let's double check. Actually, it's been a while. Um, you can see if I click on the render view, just a test, and I'll go in this, of course, in detail. Uh, it's rendering the wrong render that I want to use, unfortunately. So I should have checked those settings before I started rendering. So I'm hitting the escape key to cancel this, but this is great if you make these mistakes too. More than likely, unless you have some experience, we're going to be rendering in software just because it's 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 much more straight out of the box point and click camera. Not as good as Arnold, but it's definitely easier. Okay, I'm going to try to render this again. You can click on this little clapboard right here. You got a little message, and you can see it renders. So the light is not on on by de or shadows are not on by default for software. I think they're on by default for Arnold actually. All right, again, the clapboard right here will start your render process. I'm going to move this message out of the way. You can see it makes renders. And eventually, we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and turn on shadows for this, this light. I had to double check that. Um, and again, you can push, put this position this anywhere you want. All that matters for directional lights, at least, is how it's rotated. You can even scale this up and down. If you want the icon to be bigger, you can scale it up and down. That won't, won't affect anything, except making the icon bigger. All right, so now under shadows, I'm going to click on use depth map shadows. And uh, this particular shadow method is not the best, um, but it is, again, we're settling for e you know ease of, of conditions here. Um, and what this does is creates a shadow using a texture map. If you're familiar with programs like Photoshop, um, it uses a texture sheet and kind of casts it on there under the hood um, and makes that them. Now, default out of the box, it's probably going to look pretty bad. Let's go ahead and take a quick look. Yeah, that looks pretty awful. You know, awful, awful, awful. Um, so what you can do is you can mess with a few of these settings. First off, don't leave your shadow color solid black. Either make it like a really dark gray, or if you're feeling fancy, maybe even put like some blue or some purple or some color into it. Uh, don't leave it solid black. Um, again, I'm just going to make it, I'm going to try just making it like a really really dark purple. It doesn't take much. I'm going to gray it out a bit too. So gray it out by my purple. I just clicked on the little swatch, same way we did materials, and hit, I'm going to hit render. I think I can go even lighter. Render again. You can see that's probably perhaps a little bit too much. So you know maybe gray it out a little bit more, go a little bit darker, just a little bit. And you can see I'm fine tuning this. And that's good for now. The other thing you can do is more specific if we're looking at the line here. So again, mess with your shadow color. The other thing you can do is you can increase the resolution to make that, that shadow line that you saw there look sharper because it looks very, very blurry. Or very, very pixelated, I should say. Um, you can increase the resolution just like you would for a, an image in Photoshop. And I do generally stay in powers of two, so either 512, uh, 1024, 2048, 256, 128, and so on. I um, it doesn't really matter anymore. You can drag it, but I guess I'm just because I'm old school. Um, it's generally recommended you stay in powers of two because it saves memory, very little, but saves memory. Um, all right, so you can see this is sharper, and if we wanted to, we can keep turning this up. And you know, I think I think the max is like 16k now or something. Um, and you can see, you know, that's all right. So if you want a sharp shadow, you can turn that value up. So resolution will sharpen the shadow more and more and more the higher this gets. Now, of course, you can go the exact opposite direction, and that would be I'm going to drop this back down to 512. That would be here, filter size. So anytime you see the word filter size in Maya, it generally means blur. So in this case, it's going to blur the shadow edge between where the light and the dark meet of the shadow. So it's going to blur it. Um, this is whole integers. It usually only goes up to like 5. So I come in here and I, again, I drop my resolution back down to 512. And I upped my filter size and I'll do another render here. Test render. You can see it blurred those shadows. It kind of softened them. So if you want soft blobby shadows, you want a lower resolution and a high filter size. If you want sharp shadows, you want a high resolution and a low filter size. And of course, you can mix in between 
to try to, you know, to get something benefit of both worlds. But at that point, you really kind of just have to keep playing, do a few test renders, play, test render, play, test render. Now, again, I want you to take a look at this beforehand because if you want to go back and change your material colors, you can do that. But, you know, again, don't spend too much time on this. But you do, it does, lighting does help a lot. Don't get me wrong. In a, in a, in a, a bigger production scene, non-exercise, I would really, really, really be going through and making sure all the lighting's fine. But again, this is this is an exercise, so I don't want you to. Um, again, I'm testing this stuff as I'm talking. I don't want you to spend too much time on it. But feel free to you know do a few things. All right, so you can see there is my shadow. Um, I'm gonna call that good. If my things were too dark here, especially in the dark side, I could come back into my materials, play with my materials some more or increase the ambient value, but I think everything's looking pretty good. Um, and again, you, you, I hit the 7 key to preview lights, which are like, where's the shadow? They don't actually preview the shadows by default. Um, you have to turn the, the, the shadows on. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know a way of doing this without clicking on little icons. It's this icon right here. It's next to the light. looks like a little blue ball, and that's a little shadow next to it. Um, if you click on that, it will preview the shadows. And again, this is a preview. This is not what it would look like if you've actually rendered out the scene. But that's a preview. Um, the last thing that I'm going to talk about on shadows is sometimes um, if you render something, it kind of has it going on here and here. Sometimes you get little glitches. Um, sometimes you see like little triangling or self-shadowing. Um, this usually can be fixed by messing with the attribute called bias, which is right here, which is um, how far the shadow sticks off the geometry. So if I come in here and I increase this number, it doesn't usually take much. So I'm just, and actually I'm gonna do a lot, quote unquote, by just going to 0.1, and you can see it will change it. Now let's find out if it made it better. No, it didn't make it better. So you can see it changes it. So you can play with this bias value however you want. But most of the time, you don't have to mess with this too much. And you can see I'm making it worse, actually, which is great. I'm um, actually toning down the bias. So you play with the bias value, you, you know, you can get that. But again, you will only get this if you, um, if for some reason your scene has issues with um, the thing. Mine has some slight issues, so I'm actually trying to, to adjust the light a little bit. And again, we're using one of the more simplified um, lighting solutions right now. So yeah, you know, it's 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 not. This is the point-and-click camera. It's not the best camera, but it's it's you know, it's great for out-of-the-box stuff. All right, so we'll get there. Um, the other thing I can I can potentially do is I can also filter the light even more. So let's go ahead. And, uh, all right. Um, yeah, I think we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to call that because otherwise I can spend a bit of time troubleshooting that. Um, the other thing you can do is um, I'm not sure what's gonna happen here is you can add a secondary light. Um, if you do add a secondary light, I don't recommend a directional light. I recommend like a point light. Point light is a secondary light um, that does not again all lights don't cast shadows unless you turn them on, even if they show up in the preview. Well, actually, if I click them, that's what I don't like about our preview. We could turn that off, but you can see it's not casting a shadow. It's unless I turn on the shadow, but that looks pretty good. You know, it has a lot of brightness to it. So you gotta kind of have to ignore that. Um, and I'm gonna tone down the intensity. Maybe you know what? I might even add a little bit of color to it. That's eh, okay. I won't add any color to it. There we go. So you can still see it's that, that might, those lines. This was bothering me those lines, but I do like the brightness of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave that alone. All right. So here's my scene. Um, I've added some color materials. Here's a last look at it. Um, if you like these kinds of renders and you want to keep these, just one last thing for you guys um, that want to maybe have to mess with this, or maybe you want to do like progress shots or show this off before you start animating it to your friends, is you can change the settings of the renderer um, by clicking on this is the, how you render the current frame. This is the render settings. Um, if you click on the render settings and scroll, scroll way down, this is the reason I'm doing this is because it's one last ditched effort to fix that little bump there uh, that you saw in my lighting. 
is but if you come down here you can change the size under image size there are some presets in here and you can also custom type in sizes again if you're familiar with uh, Photoshop or any pixel based program by default this these sizes are in pixels uh, I think those are fine personally we all tend to HD 1080 why not but the other thing that you can do which is the last thing I'm gonna check on before I get I'm not gonna go any deeper than this but one last thing you can do to try to fix those little weird graphics glitches that you see is you can switch this from Maya so um, um, from um, basically preview, which you have under Maya software here. You can change this quality from custom to production, which is a, a bunch of preset settings. And do that. And it'll up the settings. And I'm going to come back to common. Just double check. Change my settings. And this stuff automatically saves and closes. Now if I go ahead and zoom out a little bit and do a render again, I want to see if it's, if it's still in there. And it still has it. So um, this is most likely being casted from like a very rim light on there. You know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to have to accept this because again, uh, for me to troubleshoot this right now might be take up too much time, unfortunately. Okay, so there is what it looks like at a little bit higher resolution. Um, this is not going to be my finalized framing. I just want to show you how to to make the these renders a little bit bigger if you want to see them in more detail. The other thing that if you again if you want to keep these, you can come up to the inside the render view, do file, save image, which will open up a save dialog, and you can save it out as anything as you want. I generally recommend a JPEG. If you save it as a PNG, all this empty black here is transparent as far as Maya is concerned. So if you save it as a PNG, um, this would be this black would be transparent. Now so that's a great thing, especially if you're doing like compositing for film or something like that. That's how you would do that. Um, this would be transparent. Um, if you don't, you just want to keep it, you know, and make it simple. Again, if you save the image as a JPEG, it will automatically force this to be black um, back here, so it'll flatten the image and make it flat with no transparency. Now the other thing, um, again, I, I don't want to. Add any more length to this this film that you know this video than I have to. Um, you want to change you pretty much for all the things we'll be doing in this class, and thankfully I'm only going to do this once. Is the the default mode is set to raw image. You're going to want all your renders to be in color managed. Um, and again, just touch on why that what raw image is is if it doesn't try to color correct anything, and that sounds bad, right? You're like, oh, I want it to color manage, but raw images. When they don't color manage or try to do anything, that gives video compositors more flexibility to do a lot of things. Since this is not a video compositing course, we won't be doing that. So we're just going to let the computer go ahead and actually color manage. So um, when you get into like high end like film, they would normally leave this as raw, but we're going to color manage it to save ourselves some time. And what that all that will do is it'll make this. You, when you open up the file in, in Preview or Photoshop, it'll look exactly like this. If you don't do this, if you open this up in Photoshop or something, or Preview, this will be a lot darker. It won't look like this. It'll look darker. It'll look like, hold on, i got to cancel this. It'll look like this. So that's with the a raw image. And there's a little Preview button right here. That's with the color managed. Raw color managed. So if you want it to look like this, and you save out the image, and again, I'm just going to save this as a JPEG. Absurd machine test render, absurd machine render, color managed, and you can just save it wherever you like. And you can see if I go to my desktop and find it, and I'm just going to open my my Windows Preview. It pretty much looks the exact same. And again, you need to make sure that checkbox you can see there it is in render view and there it is in the thing they're going to be pretty close if you don't check that box and again that setting will save forever so you don't have to only have to do it once but it's very crucial that you do it um, make sure that color managed image is checked all right so there we go we went over some some of the modeling functions as I did. Granted, it wasn't a full full modeling thing, but went over a few more tips and tricks. Covered briefly materials for specifically for this assignment, as well as some lighting. Um, when we come back from the next lecture, we will we will be getting into animation, 
and talking about the basics of keyframe animation and how they specifically apply to this one. And we'll have to do some cleanup as well, but we'll save that for the animation lecture. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Hopefully you know model out your machine. There's bound to be mistakes. Um, if you have problems, um, you know, you know, like I said, make, make sure you save copy so we we can work through them. And just you know, give give it a shot, and then we'll, I'll help you guys as best I can through through the course of the, of course of the class. And um, we will talk then and have fun creating. Take care.